Before we begin today's podcast, I'd like to thank Barbell Apparel, premium athletic wear engineered for performance with a tailored athletic fit, refined clothing for an athletic body type. You can use barbell slash best and get hooked up with Barbell Apparel. As Evolution Athletics, supportive gear owned by Brian Shaw, four-time World's Strongest Man. We believe in all athletes that support their journey towards greatness, and you can get to that greatness with the gear, his stuff. It works. It uses I have the soft belt. God damn it. I love that thing. First form. First form. Our mission is to help real people get real long-term results, and you can do that at first form. Use the link in the notes. It really helps us out. Want to be coached by 10-time World's Strongest Man competitor, Masters World's Strongest Man, World Powerlifting Champion Nick Best? Well, guess what? You can get under his tutelage, fill out the link in the notes. Once you fill out the link, once you fill out the form, you'll receive an email from me. And once you get that email back, just pick the program you want, and it's that easy. That's Nick Best Coaching. Make sure you go check it out. Links are in the notes. And let's get into today's show. All right, this is the best experience with your host, Nick Best and the Angry Dad. And we have a special guest. We have Coach Joe Ken. The host is in the house. House yes. in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but he's the vice president of performance, ed- education, dynamic fitness, and strength. He was a uh, strength and conditioning coach for eight years in the NFL. And he also happened to train and conditioned with uh, one of the strongest men in the world, four-time strongman, Brian Shaw. And uh, I've got, actually met you twice. I met you in Sacramento, and I yeah. uh, and we were down over here in uh, Myrtle Beach this year. And like I said, it it was a great experience for me, you know what I'm saying, especially mm-hmm. being around, you know, pe- the like elite people like yourself and, and just seeing everything happening for all the strength and conditioning. Well, it, it takes I appreciate a lot of that. And, you know, it's funny because when people – uh, you always accept acknowledgement. I don't care what anyone says when people – you try to stay as humble as you can, but yeah. uh, you're only as good as the people you surround yourself by. And and most of the time, uh, uh, the the great – a great coach, and he, he wouldn't call himself great, but he was a great athlete too. Judd Logan, who was a four-time Olympian uh, hammer thrower, worked with my son, and he said – Great coaches are made by great athletes. There's only good coaches, and I think there's a little, I think there's a little truth to that. And how do you separate yourself? Is I think the good coach puts him, puts themselves in a position that they surround themselves with greatness, <laughs> and, it ele- and it elevates them. And uh, you know, fortunately for me, I've been very, very, uh, you know, blessed if you want to call it that, or fortunate to be in a position with the jobs that I've had, the people I've been was able to hire, and then the people I've been able to meet that it mm-hmm. just seems like all those degrees of separation and connection, we've all been high achievers. And for the last two years, you know, Brian and Kerry and the Shaws have given me an opportunity to work with one of the highest achievers ever in his particular sport. So I've got to really learn a lot about myself as a coach, as a person in this new world of online virtual coaching, which I still can't wrap my head around if if coaching (laughs) is the right title for it, because Mm -hmm. my definition of coaching is a little bit different. I think it's a a hands-on position, and you're Mm hands-off a lot. And the last two years, and Nick and I have had a couple Mm -hmm. of conversations because Nick and Brian are are very close. Uh, there's there's a lot of things I thought last year I missed physically because I was still learning the space and I was still learning how to deal with someone who handles the loads that they handle when in my world, a lot of that training is easy because in team sports, math means a lot in training. It's same, similar to powerlifting. Math right. means a lot when you're trying to factor in training loads what I learned with elite level strongman, some of that can pay off in the off season, but once it's time for the comp, you got to throw the math out because these guys go a lot on the auto regula- regulation of it and truly the highs and lows of handling that type of loads. Like it's mm-hmm. amazing to me to watch these guys a lot of times on their YouTube channels where I had to study a lot where uh, like, for example, I remember one, one time I'm watching Martin Lisi's. 
and mm -hmm. he misses 825 in the deadlift. I'm like, wow, man, that was what what's going on? Like then the next week he does it for five, right? Like it's like <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. And there was a couple of times where Brian would go, Oh, I just think I need a cheesecake. And I'm like, seriously, a cheesecake <laughs> is gonna change all that. And then this year, yeah. what I think I learned a lot too is without being there was more the mental part of what a good coach can recognize. And I knew he had put a, and again, I don't want to speak for Brian. I never want to speak. It's his story, but right. I knew he had put a lot on this one. Mm -hmm. The last one. A lot on himself. And, yeah. And, and, I, and I really felt deep down in my heart. Cause I wrote this in the debrief last year because Nick and I know there were some contemplations last year, what to do next. And, mm -hmm. and I put down, can this athlete win the world's strongest man at 41 years old? I said, yes. I said, if th can this man podium at world's strongest man at 41 years old? Yes, because I believe that. Yeah. And going into this, when he, you know, I believed he can do it, especially when they gave the events out so early. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was such a better event lineup for him mentally because. Here's yep. what people don't understand, and I think Nick's done a great job of this with how he trains. Obviously, Mark Felix does a great job of this, and guys like Brian. How do you control? Because the older you get, the more cerebral you get, mm -hmm. and the more you have deliberate intentions that you've got to focus and visualize on because you're going to succeed more on strategy than your overall capabilities because – I say it all the time. We all are trying to beat the birth certificate. The birth certificate's going to win. But the question is, how long can you maintain the fact right. that you can beat it? Right. Mm -hmm. where, where, like, again, there were certain things that happened throughout the event, right, where psychologically the older athlete, it's going to affect them more. Where 10 years ago, I could, you know, that athlete could give two shits for the lack of a better term of, oh, they're going to do this. I don't care. I'm the best. They're going to do right. this. I don't care. I'm the best. Now it's, they're going to do this. Wait, I spent, you know, an hour in my meditation and visualization process of this is how the day's going to go. Right. This is how I'm going to hit. It'd be yeah. like in powerlifting where, hey, man, today's my first time I'm going to squat 800. And you walk in and they go, hey, we're changing the events. We're going to deadlift first. And yeah. squat mm -hmm. last. Yeah. And man, that's it. You're not even deadlifting good. Yeah. Not yeah. even deadlifting good. So yeah. I, I learned, I've said this, the best thing that I've learned in the two years of working with Brian is continuing to educate myself and know that people always say the 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 no question's a stupid question. And I think there's mm -hmm. a lot of merit to that. So mm -hmm. I learned a lot about what my role was last year with Brian as far as the coach. And now this year I've learned more that dealing with individual athletes, you've got to continue to make sure that this is, is level. Like mm -hmm. they're not putting additional stress where, and you're looking at pass of who they were, mm -hmm. you know? And again, I, I listen to laws a lot too. I like watching some of his stuff on YouTube and, He'll always bring up like, man, it's hard for me to believe that this is what I do when I did this. But that's who you are now. Like that's your hundred mm -hmm. percent. Mm -hmm. Like it's the, different, and that's and that's what you got to remember. Like for me, I know what my hundred percent is. It's not what it was when I was twenty six. It's not what it was when I was thirty six. So I'm pushing the gauntlet of what's my hundred percent now, and and it's hard for the see for me as a competitive power lifter i was always a class two lifter so for me joe average but for the elite guys that's so much harder for them to gravitate to because they've done things that are inhuman and it's hard for even them to come to that realization that i i can't i can't really do these things anymore and it crushes them and Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a different attack point. Like, how do you go about like, like, that, like Nick's personality fits what I think is why he's able to do it because he attacks things jovial there. I think he puts internal pressure on him, but it looks like there's this really just an opportunity <laughs> to be there, be around people. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it, and there's different people have different motivation goals. Like mm -hmm. 
I laugh when someone said, oh, Brian is going to do Worlds over 40. Brian, Brian Shaw, after the Shaw Classic, I highly will mm. – I'll bet all the money I ever made in coaching will never compete again. That guy competes to win the best of the best of the best. Mm. That's his mindset. There's a reason why. 15 straight finals. I was just talking to a good friend of mine that knows Brian from the Arizona State days and goes, I go, the guy went to 15 straight finals. None of these guys will last 15 years. And that's nothing against mm. them. Yeah. It's nothing against any of them. So <laughs> you, you're, you're 66% of the time you were on the podium. You never finished lower than seventh. Right. And, and I think where Brian's mentality is that, right? Like if I can't win, I'm out. Mm -hmm. But then you see the other appreciation from another standpoint, like look at Luke Stoltman, who's closing in on 40, I believe. He's closing in mm -hmm. on that infamous he's, Masters he's getting level, close. Yeah. yeah, like 38 or 39. You see him make the finals, and he's glor like he's like, I've proven that I am one of the 10 most strongest men in the world. Yeah. You know, like when you look at Mark Felix, Mark came in fourth in his group two years in a row at 56 and 57 years old. Mm -hmm. When you look at it from the standpoint of the entire group, that means that he's top 20 in the world. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, for if, sure. If you want to look at it that way, because every group has two guys that were fifth and sixth, mm -hmm. that's 10 people. He's top, oh, 20. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he's top 20 in the world at 57. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty freaky. <laughs> you know, that, so that's truly that's freaky. the things that you learn. Uh, and, it, and you learn a lot about – uh, the, the individualities of different people and how their personas change because that's the hard part with people that coach individual athletes are there's a tremendous amount of internal pressure to succeed because you can't hide behind anyone else. You know, football's easy. You, yeah. you, you have 11 people aside and you hide under a helmet. Yeah, unless you get a penalty, nobody knows I play offensive guard except my girlfriend. <laughs> or not, who, who's now my wife and my dad who's watching me and not watching the ball. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you're out there and that was, and that was one of the reasons why when my, my, when my kids were younger, I got them into powerlifting, not necessarily because I wanted them to be powerlifters. I wanted them to compete in an individual sport. So they understood the pressure of walking up there and looking around and there's no one else to be found. Mm -hmm. right. My older son excelled in team sports they both did team sports, but my youngest son excelled as a thrower. And I think some of his ability to walk into the ring with a profound confidence and understanding, I think was probably helped that I had him powerlifting as a teenager. So there's a lot of good things that happen from individual sports and the team sports. Uh, team sports to individual, I don't know because there's very it's a very unique. That would be an interesting thing to watch. We're seeing Tom Evans do it now in the mm -hmm. strongman space, mm -hmm. but yeah. you don't, you don't see a lot of team sport guys converting to strongman and there. And I've coached a lot of guys who could they win world strongest man. I don't know that, but they could probably be pretty highly successful and get a chance to possibly get an invite. Right. Which there's a lot of freak athletes in the NFL. I'm sure you've dealt with more than a few guys that can actually get there without a problem because yeah, I mean, I coached guys that weighed over 400 pounds. Yeah, they're the freaks. Now, that, the freaks that, didn't the freaks. Help them, that didn't help them make an NFL roster, but <laughs> right. they were freaky. And then look at some of these guys now, like uh, DJ Metcalf and Tyreek Hill going to track meets and, and holding their own with world-class athletes. And, and I know the way they got to train for football. For them to run that fast, mm -hmm. that means they're legitimately fast. Like right. Those dudes <laughs> got something special. So, again, it just comes to what you gravitate towards, right? And it's um, – mm -hmm. It's very unique. Like I'll I'll be real interested, and I'm sure Nick Nick would be too. Is where the strongman space really changes now that the Bryans and the Zavikases and the big and I know Tom Stoltman would be considered one of the bigger guys. He fits mm -hmm. that mold a little bit, but right. he's still young enough where he's athletic like Brian was. But right, most of these other guys are. You know, I told somebody that I said. If you're between 6'3 and 6'5 and weigh between 330 and 340, that's what a strong man's going to win. That's the winning strong man mm -hmm. combination right now. But, right. You, but the wear and tear of how many comp competitions these guys go to, how how much, you know, and again, 
A lot of them, this is their job. So they got to show up to try to get on the podium. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it can wear you out. That was one thing where I, I, I know I always – I told Brian, and I'll to say this out loud. I told Brian, I said, you need to start invousing all these world's strongest men because they owe you a commission for all their YouTube channels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. Because he's shown them how to be a true businessman and, and to monetize who they are. And and it shows, like, there's a reason why Strongman is what it is. Because the guy comes in seventh place and he stands on his feet for mm-hmm. five hours afterwards yeah. signing autographs. He never yep. sat down and he addressed every single coach mm-hmm. or, excuse me, every single person mm-hmm. in the eye and legitimately looks at him or her and here's their story. And yep. then he comes back and does it the next night for five mm-hmm. and a half hours. Yeah. Uh, my question is to the world's strongest man community, and I'm talking about the people who run the show, is I found it funny that no one from World is Strongest Man is smart enough to stick around and see the impact that this guy had. Yep. When we were there, and Nick was there for quite a bit, mm-hmm. the only ones left were the security guys, the security dogs, and Team Shaw. Yeah. yeah, that was the only ones left at eight thirty that night, yeah. uh, and then the next night was a private event that we we got to run at a at a local gym there. Yeah, so that was more fine. But the night, but the night of the deal was something that I don't think world's strongest man understands. Like if they have that thing at Myrtle Beach again, it'll have half the crowd, yeah. and, and it'll still be a great event because it was a great venue. It was set up great. Mm-hmm. He but, said about thirty thousand people. Yeah, thirty to forty thousand was in, yeah. down here in the local stuff. I, I'm and fairly never, sure if they do that again, they're gonna probably install actual grandstands. Well, they have, of just yeah, that was the one. They gotta they take the stages. Find out. I, I think they could have easily have done higher. They could have went at least twenty rows up yeah. on steel steel mm-hmm. stages out there. Mm-hmm. That, you know, lesson learned. But yeah. You know, because I mean, I'll tell you what, I'd like to have been the Home Depot that sold all those steps. <laughs> that's it. Dying. I know, right? And they, and they came out in droves the, the second day of qualifying. I see 12 yeah. foot ladders out there. <laughs> I know. So, it, you know, that's, that's my, you know, that's to me, that's where me now in the role I'm in now, I'm learning so much more about business. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just like no brainers, man. This is a guy like, this is the guy, man. Like, you can't keep patting him on the back and kudo on what he's done for world's strongest man. And then not, then when the event's over, you're like, it's, you know, it's, Hey man. Yeah. yeah. It's like, they should have been there with the camera the whole time. The whole time. Yeah. Honestly. I mean, the whole time. You know, oh, yeah. it's, it's all a media play anyway. So yeah. mm-hmm. it was, you know, like I said, man, I've learned a lot. I've gotten to meet, uh, you know, again, I, my, the coolest thing for me is to meet, like I met, I've always loved Nick and, and Mark from afar because that's my age. Mm-hmm. And the fact mm-hmm. that you get to meet them, and again, you could call, you know, it's like, a, you know, like you don't want to meet your heroes because sometimes they disappoint. Yeah. I've been, I've been fortunate that most of the people that I admire have not disappointed. And just to watch the way they interact and just the things that they're accomplished is what, so like for those guys like that motivate me, I try to train hard for the guys who are more like me to say, hey man. You know, I'm just an ex beat up Division One college football player trying to fight the good fight. There's people like looking at me because mm-hmm. I look at these guys, and I can understand because I've been around what that looks like for those levels. But there's a lot of people that look at me like I can't do that. Yeah, but you can train hard enough anyway. It's not about what mm-hmm. I'm doing; it's how hard I'm trying to do it, and what I'm trying to accomplish to show that, hey man, it, it doesn't matter who you are. Your level is your level. Just understand that. And then you're trying to fight to beat that level. Yeah, just try to be the best you can at that level. That's all, that's all you can really do. It, it, just in general, if you're always beating yourself, eventually you'll beat everybody else. Yeah, and, 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 and like just I be say, the best you. you know, if I go in the gym today and I do a new exercise, uh, that's my best ep- You know, That's my all-time best. If, mm-hmm. 50, man, I keep losing you guys. Sorry about that. Oh, oh, nice, it's okay. Right? You're, We're here. you're still fine on us. Yeah, okay. You're but, uh, no, so yeah, it's been a it's been a cool journey. I've been very very fortunate to, you know, I mean, and like anything else, you know, people don't get enough credit. All, all, everything revolves around my wife. I mean, I get mm. to do everything because uh, she always, in the end, knows that this is who I am, and 
I get to do some really cool stuff and it's been a, it's been fun. I will, I will, it's been a lot different for us these last three years because I work from home and right. for the first 30 years of our marriage, I was never home. <laughs> no, how did that turn? How did that go? When all yeah, of a sudden you weren't there and then you're there. <laughs> it, it, it was more, well, who's the bigger adjustment for you or me, her? Me, okay. because I'm more, I'm a, I'm a very selfish with my time because just the way and i'm and i'm kind of a i don't need to be around anybody person like mm. i just need to know you're there and i'll i'm cool where the rest of my family are really close they like doing things together and like hey i'll stay home and then i get yelled at and then i wind up coming but <laughs> uh, big it, was, it was it was more of an adjustment for me because i'm used to being very regimented and calling the shots like through my entire career, my wife would always remember when I'd walk in the door. Now, remember, you're not at work with your subsidiaries. You're at home now. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, for well, for nine years at the Panthers, I I actually lived in Charlotte, and my my wife lived here in Clemens, and I didn't oh. see her really for nine years. We saw each other just hours a week. Wow. Uh, even though we were an hour and ten minutes away, because she was here taking care of the family, uh, she was here helping my oldest son and his wife and girlfriend at the time with the two, with my two grandkids. So it was really a, a unique situation. But what I think it proves is when you have the right life partner, nothing gets in the way. Mm -hmm. And so now is a time where uh, being here, I'm still trying to wrap my head around being a stay at home worker because that's been mm -hmm. Uh, very unique. Uh, I'm I'm in a very good situation with the company I work with because it is fitness related. Mm -hmm. So I really benefit from that because it allows me to do the stuff I do. Right. You know, it allows me to, to go into these events and really I have a better uh, platform to show my ability to provide to the coaches it, differently than when I'm locked into one specific university or team because then you're you got to watch how you hand yourself because you represent the logo. Mm -hmm. And right. in my position now and my title, me doing things like this represents the logo. Right. Because there's a lot of NFL teams that won't let coaches do podcasts. They won't let them speak oh. at clinics. Yeah. Uh, if they do speak at clinics, they can't, they can't be um, promoted as the strength coach of the team. Mm -hmm. Like there was several times I was a clinic where it said Joe Ken, NFL strength coach. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's a, it's Why a little bit that? uh because they don't want, I, I think a lot of it is there's some uh name image and likeness marks too, as far as their logos and stuff. Yeah. Sure, trademarks. Sure. And I always said this anyway, that they don't want you trading off their name. Hey. Well, yeah, but they're, they're getting something from your name. Well, and your they, ability. A, a lot of times they don't think that way. Well, you know, it's a, it's a, the it's NFL a is it, yeah, I mean it is what it is. I mean, luckily for me, I was in a I was in a program where the GM, the head coach, they were they were very supportive. So I didn't have a lot of the uh kind of nuances that some of the others did, but you know, that's they you know, they're billionaires running billionaire businesses. They get mm -hmm. to make their decisions the way they yeah. want. So yeah. that that's um that's a story for another day. It was a, <laughs> it was a good run. Like people always say, oh, do you miss it? Of course you miss it, right? But don't. I always say, don't feel bad for me. My coach, nine years in the NFL. You know how hard that is. Mm -hmm. You know, I, co yeah. I coach. I had one of thirty-two jobs in the whole world. I'm cool. Like, I got. You know, I, I was at. I we didn't win the Super Bowl. I coached in the Super Bowl. I coached in London. I coached in the Pro Bowl. I coached. Looks like I could probably have coached. You know, four four, possibly five Hall of Famers in the future. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and one of them, I, I really believe he's going to get in, Steve Smith, out of coaching mm -hmm. college and the pros. Man. So that's even going to be that's pretty super amazing. cool. And I introduced him to his agent. So oh. that would have been <laughs> yeah. super duper cool <laughs> if he gets in. So, you know, and again, I don't know. Uh, the biggest thing that you learn over time, and I think this goes with any profession, but uh, – really much gravitates towards sports is whether you're an athlete or a coach, 
And I think Nick's probably still chasing the success, but he's at a point now where the significant impact that he makes on individuals in our age bracket who want to be competitive, his personality and the style he presents himself, it, it makes a significant impact on motivating probably more. Just like Brian finds out, the amount of people that he's probably resonating with, you're never going to know. And, and it's the same thing for me in my in my coaching world. Like when you're when you're in sports, success has to matter because you're judged mm -hmm. on winning and losing. Mm -hmm. No one's judging these guys on if they would have judged Brian on how well he trained. Nick knows compared to last year, he'd have been on the podium and probably won. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. The way the way his training came into play this year. Well, uh, it, it, the the crazy thing about that was is what he went through. Yes. At the beginning of it. <laughs> I mean, he almost lost his leg. And yeah, and again, that was that, that like, he told, like I didn't realize how bad it was till the video. I was like, yo, yeah. man, you held out on me. Well, yeah. I, I knew how bad it was. Yeah, I did he didn't and really give me the whole I, I've deal, been through so. Yeah, I've been through something similar. I was on an antibiotics IV for a week. And I had to wear a little pump around with me when I went through this. Well, yeah, like, that's what I remember guys. saying to him because I knew what they put that pick line in and mm -hmm. then he said he was going home and was going to jump in the room. And I was like, Hey, did they pull up? Cause I know my wife had a pick line in and they said, you can't train with a pick line. <laughs> so he made him pull it out. So, yeah. Yeah. So for me, you know, the, the success has always got to be there if you're a competitor because winning matters. But at some point in time, like I, what else more do I have to accomplish for me to where you get to that point where I just want to make a significant impact on my profession. And mm -hmm. I see that when I go to these conferences and the amount of coaches who will come up and visit us at the booth and, Hey, your, you know, your programming has made this for me and oh the block that, how would you do this? And it's, it's just about just building relationships. And that's what's helped me in my role now is because I get to meet, more of the people I've made an impact on. Because mm -hmm. if I'm at a school or a university, I don't get to do it. Like next week I'll visit, uh, probably visit one or two colleges and I'm going to Fort Bragg next week. Mm -hmm. uh, the oh, week wow. after that, uh, I'll probably visit a couple of high schools. And then, then I go to the national events and then you get the conglomerate of all that stuff. So it's been, a, it's been really good because it's helped me, like anything else, stay relevant because – you hate to say it, you know, you can't, there's not supposed to be discrimination, but you're going to age out of athletics and you're going to age out of coaching. Yeah. And somebody made a great point in their recap of the conference. I was just at coaches are getting younger and younger mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's more of them, especially in oh. strength and conditioning because schools are paying more. They're investing more into the whole gauntlet of student athlete health, where welfare and development. Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to so have to get crazy. They're going to have to because there's so much money to be made online oh, training yeah. for yourself that and unless they come with, you know, six figures, the guy can sit in his computer and do it at home. Oh, no. 100%. And, and not have any of the <laughs> any of the uh, issues with going to the school and all the different athletes and everything, all the hell that you guys go through getting up <laughs> at four o'clock in the morning and putting your workout in because that's something people don't realize about you. You will do it first. Yeah. You don't I, I, I started towards the end of my career. I started because I started trading at a local gym, mm -hmm. but even then, because it was a 24 hour deal, most of the time I'm up at four getting my workout in mm -hmm. before the team comes in for a lot of reasons. I, uh, I know there was several times in my NFL career where guys said they would walk through the gym because you had to get through the weight room to get to the locker room a lot of times. And guys were like, man, I just didn't have it. And then I walk in and see you guys in there training and they're like, oh, I'll get it through. Plus when you build that rapport with the guys, they also know that, Hey man, I'm going to, I'm going to take care of you. Like I'm, I understand what the real, the real dynamics are. You playing football on Sundays. And right. that's the, and that's the other thing that, team sport coaches have to realize about dealing with like everybody goes, what's the hardest thing about training a world's strongest man competitor? Well, that shit matters. Like <laughs> if my guy benches 400 one day and misses 400, he's still going to get 10 tackles on Sunday. 
Right. If my guy misses a 400 log, that just cost him six points. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And now, he's in the, and now he's in the stone off somewhere <laughs> he doesn't want to be. You know, it's like, it's like just crazy stuff like that that people don't understand. And that's why, like, I'm very, very excited to watch Tom Evans' progression mm -hmm. in, in Strongman. I think, you know, I don't ever want to limit people, but mm -hmm. – as I watch how these strongman events are trying to set their own little specifics of what this means. Mm -hmm. Cause again, when you really start looking now at world's strongest man, mm -hmm. if you compare the way it's now, I think it's a durability, it's a durability game. World's strongest man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, and that's where guys at the age brackets of the Bryans and the Luke Staltman's, have to get kudos to getting to the second event day, the second competition. Yeah. But what oh, you're okay. seeing now is they've put so much to get to the second competition. There's not enough wasted. days in between to get to the finish line of why you really wanted to be there. Right. And I'll put some of that on world's strongest man. Cause they, they don't need that stone off as cool as it, as cool as it looks for TV. And as cool as it looks to watch two guys go out there and sell themselves to the end, maybe have that in the finals. How about do that for the last event? That would be something interesting, wouldn't it? Because then it's over, it's done. The the five guys that get into the stone off, for the most part, are at such a disadvantage. They're lucky if they'll break the top five. Well, it's like, and you know, Nick, back then, like even like even like uh, Brian said, and. And last year, when he, it was even a little different advantage because he came in third, so it actually mm -hmm. benefited him to have the stone off last year. But right. that's not to say that if they did what they usually did and had an Atlas stone run at the end of the events, that he wouldn't have won his group on the stones and gotten to the finals anyway. So right, and the guys do five stones. Yeah, and they so don't get I that think beat it's up. so I think it's everybody just have some have six events and like you said, it might not need to be a stones. Just have six events in the frigging qualifiers that everybody. And, and everybody's got to run them. Like, just right. tell like, hey, everybody's com got to compete in all six. If well, you dog one, we're, t we're penalizing you points. Well, that's the way it used to be. And then they tried to do double points for Atlas Stones. Yeah. No, just, hey, man. That really didn't work. You got six You got six events in the, in the prelims. Everybody right. does all six. Everybody does all six. That's just the yeah. way. And, I, and there's one thing, like, and I, and I, and I know a lot. And, again, I just evaluate watching different – people and i think he brought it up i didn't listen for sure but like everybody was looking at when mitch hooper went out and did all the kettle the kettlebell throws and everybody's like what's he doing well one is if you know his background he's not worried about conditioning and recovery plus no. he's 28 and no. if you look at his background that dude but i Can know suffer. this guy's cerebral enough to know this he doesn't have all the equipment in his house yet and he hasn't done all the events. So for him, in a less taxing movement, he's like, I'm going to run the gauntlet because i got to learn how to do this stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, And again, it, do it doesn't affect a 28-year-old. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he, the, the thing no, people don't get is – going to the stone off, so he's like, I'll take a run at it. Yeah. And then he's a marathoner. Yeah. I mean, come on. The guy ran 26 miles and suffered for 26 miles. He can and handle and pain. If, he play, and if you play golf, you're walking four and a half miles anyway mm -hmm. doing that too. That's yeah. it. And yeah, if he would have won that, he would have been the first strong man to ever win all his heats. All yeah, the so, events in the heats, yeah. So yeah. you look at it that way and you see how world's strongest man is going. See, to me, it's almost the world's strongest athlete. <laughs> yeah, it's gotten that way again, yeah. And now you're looking at like – but back to the Mario days. Yes. And then you got like the Arnold. When, remember, they created the Arnold for, for Zavikis, mm -hmm. the static mm -hmm. monsters. Hey, let's do a 9,000-pound yoke and only walk two feet, right? Like <laughs> crazy stuff like that. Well, now you see what's the Rogue Invitation do? What's the Shaw Classic? So mm -hmm. you got this interesting component of how to deliver. Because I remember – at, when that thing started separating, it was like, okay, what do I do? Like in Brian and, and Half Thor's case, on, mm -hmm. and Eddie Hall, do I bulk up the 450 to win the Arnold? But that 450 ain't helping me win World's Strongest Man anymore. Mm -mm. Nope. So it comes down to why I think that that 6'3 to 6'5, 335 to 340 guy mm -hmm. 
Like I, I knew Mitch Cooper would Mitch Hooper would win World Strongest Man last year. I didn't know he'd win it right away, but he right. was going to win one within the next three years of him competing. Oh yeah, and, nah, I'm, it, and I'm going to make my I'll make my bold prediction on your guys' on, on your guys' podcast. All right, let's hear it. Is it is it Pablo Cordiaca? Yeah, is that how you say it. Yeah, when he gains thirty more pounds, watch out. True, a hey, hit him and Mitch. Talented. Yeah. He yeah. fills that frame out. Come on, he mm-hmm. looked like an NFL tight end with his shirt off. Hey, he, he hey, shredded, shredded yeah. like that. Shredded yeah. and he lean. puts on thirty more pounds to forty more pounds and gets into that like one hundred and forty kilogram range <laughs> and or a hundred and in between. He doesn't need to be that much. Bigger than think, maybe 150. Yeah, I think it, he gets to 150, 155. It's over. He's going to be just dist- because yeah. he's so tall. Yeah, because he and has the one thing that Novikov doesn't. He has height. Yeah. 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 Hey. Like, Novikov is slightly shorter than me, and I know exactly how tall I was at my best. And all these <laughs> fictional guys who tell you they're 6'4, if I walk by them and I'm taller than them, I can promise you they're not 6'2. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So no, I'm I mean, told, that's I'm, where you look at stuff like that and where I see there, there's going to be an interesting shift because let's face it. I I'm obviously I'm pulling for Brian to win the Shaw classic yeah, and however course. he, if he needs me, I'm there. If he doesn't need me, doesn't matter. Same. I'm pulling for him to win the Shaw classic. Same. But the cool thing now is when you look at the way this seasons are set up, you literally have the grand slam of strongman now. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Mitch Hooper can pull it off. He can win the Arnold, the world's strongest man, the Shaw Classic, and the Rogue in a, in a competitive calendar year. Yes. He can do it. Because Brian was the first one to do the Arnold and, uh, and world's the, strongest and the world's man. strongest man. But I'm now, nah, but, but, and remember, that was it. Now yeah, there's the, four legitimate shows yeah. that I would put ahead of anything else. Mm-hmm. Yep. Here's your big four. And what, now the question will be, and this is where Nick could, because because you know Brian got when Brian figured it out. Brian's going, I'm going. I, it's like Tiger Woods. I only play in the big ones. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. So now that exactly. there's four big ones, and it, and the calendar year spreads them out halfway decent. Mm-hmm. When does a guy like a Mitch Hooper or someone in that type of competitive ability to podium a lot? realize I'm just going to the big four. Yeah. But 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 the attractiveness of some of these other shows and I, who knows what appearance money they're getting on the back mm-hmm. end. I don't know that part of the game, but right. you know, but like look at it, but look at what it's doing to these guys. Martin's yep. Lisey's looks like to me, and I don't know him, but if you yep. look at what this last his last few years looks like, he's gonna compete hard one year and take mm-hmm. a year off. Yep. Compete hard one year Take a year year off. off. That's what he's got to do to last. I mean, so he's looking at it a totally different game than some of these other guys where Novikov, again, and I don't – those guys, they don't train. They just compete year-round, so they're always in comp mode. Like, And that's what Sadrinas did. Yeah, they just compete, 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 compete. But the the guys running the contests in Europe, though, the contests weren't excruciatingly heavy. Mm -hmm. They were just heavy. And okay. so he could use those contests as yes, that's training. training. Right. So let me ask you this, Nick, because I just saw this one that Ivar's won, and I love Ivar's. I just, yeah, so do I. That yeah. guy is something. He he just go. He competes. You could just tell he's just a. So he, is they, a he just tough, won this event, man. and it was mm-hmm. like some kind of like speed event where they did five events in ninety minutes, man, or something like that. That event. Yeah. I thought that's what it said. Yeah. So what is that like? You just run from one event to the other, and whoever and gets the most points attack. wins. Yeah. yeah, and try not to have a heart attack in the process. Yeah. And so, and that's the thing. Like when you look at some of these older guys, mm-hmm. and again, in respect, because they've du- the dur- the the, the, uh, the durability and the longevity is the world's strongest man is a hard is a hard event when when you have to really look at who you are where. A two-day event, or even mm-hmm. one of these one-day events, you you have a chance to still be successful, right? Because you don't have to rely on recovery as much. True, true. And in, in the way the sleep, sh- yeah, in the way the show's set up now, 
when I first did World's Strongest Man, we had three days to do the six events. So that wasn't too bad. Oh, actually four days. We had four days to do the six events. We had two one day, one the next day, two, and then one or some type of combination of that. It was two, one, two, one, or, you know, or one, 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 two, two, you know, that type of stuff. And then you had four days off. Yeah. And you stayed at the hotel. You had four days. You could go get therapy. You could rest. You could recover. And then you came back and you had three events one day, three events the next day, and then done. And now it's three events one day, three events the next day, one day off. So you still and got real, and that and that one day you're going to the boneyard to do testing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to the boneyard to do testing. You're doing media, and then you're trying to get some type of therapy or get rest or just clear your head. So you're really not left to rest or recover. Well, and here's the other mm -hmm. one, Nick, and I know I don't, and I, and I you'll shake your head when I say this. We're out to dinner with Brian after the stone off when he gets a text that says, be ready at 8.30 to go to the Boneyard. Hey. Well, come hey. on, dude. We Can were with Trey Mitchell. <laughs> yeah. We, we, yeah, we were with Trey Mitchell when that happened. They yeah. were like, like, yeah. huh? Like, it's like 10 o'clock at night right now. Everyone's barely settling down. You know, so again, it, and, and, and to me, I think even one more day, where Brian could have settled down mentally and neurologically mm -hmm. because I just showed a guy at the conference this, his stone off took five minutes and 20 seconds from when Ron O'Heinler touched the stone. And just think every rep, the pressure that builds mentally on each guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Against a guy that can deadlift well over a thousand yeah, pounds. And, that, and that's what I told somebody goes, well, well, why about the other guy? I said, here's the difference. There was 10 guys in the stone off. And if you'd ask any world-class strongman rank them, they'd have ranked Brian one, Rono two. Yep. And they had to go against each other. Yep. Yeah. I'll agree with that. You know, so – and, you know, I, I – as much as I hate to say it, you got to give Rono credit because he, <laughs> he probably knew I'm not going to beat him. But the fact that he went all in, I got to give kudos to that guy because he was going all in to get yeah. to the finals himself. That's People it. People need to recognize that. Like, oh, did, did it hurt my guy from a neurologically and recovery? Yeah. When you look at it now as a coach and you got to really evaluate things, probably was it probably would have been nice to do three stones like Tom Saltman <laughs> and go home. But yeah, exactly. on the other end, let's let's give kudos to the competitive nature of that guy, knowing, hey man, this is probably gonna end on the wrong end of the stick for me, but right. I'm not just going to give it to the guy. Yeah. Well, no. And the, the thing is, is, when you're competing in the sport, anything can happen. Yeah. I you mean, don't know. Like so we saw you, last just year. Keep, you just don't give up. You just keep going and yeah, pick the wrong tacky. Mm -hmm. pick, well, got, yeah. You know, right. It happens. I mean, it cost somebody like third yeah, spot. I mean, so like, hey, it cost the guy third place in the finals this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's, I mean, um, I, you know, the guys, it's a it's an interesting dynamic. And like I said, I, I'm just I and and I over maybe people think sometimes I overdone, but I really just I keep going back to I can't thank Brian enough for giving me an opportunity to coach him yeah. because as Nick knows, he's had a lot of people that have he'll rely on for information, but because of who he is, he's never really brought somebody in to actually say we I want some help. And mm -hmm. right. The fact that he trusted me, yeah, you know, I and and I do, and I feel like I let him down a little bit because we didn't accomplish his goals, and because he, that's what he brought me in for. And as a coach, I'm always going to protect my guys. Yeah. So in the end, it's like, hey man, when he wins, he wins. When he loses, it's on me. But again, I understand the whole thing. It's just it's the way I live, and I'll and I'll continue to live that way because. I want. I need to keep that guy in a good in a good frame of mind. Like, You're right? Hey, man, this is the way it goes. And like I said, you live and learn. If you continue mm -hmm. to ask questions, um, you know, it, it'll be real interesting to see how I, I, I gave him some notes. And again, I want to say aloud. My biggest thing is I want him to just enjoy this next training cycle. Do not put anything like I got to do ten reps in this event to win. Just go out. Can beat your butt off, mm -hmm. and yep. you're good, and you're good enough 
to do what you want to accomplish in this meet. Mm-hmm. Yes. And and it's hard. And I get it. When you're that guy, it's friggin' hard because he thinks he's letting everyone down. Yeah, he does. Like, he does. I mean, like, he does. And he's he was not. like, he doesn't all get of these people came out to see me. Hey, yeah, man, they did. And they enjoyed other, it. How many other people would do what you just did <laughs> under the circumstances that were presented to you mm-hmm. in, in, in the form of what happened? So it's, um, I'll be interested to see, like I said, how does World Strongest Man itself grow? Mm -hmm. Strong Man's going to grow because of Brian's never going to be not involved. Yeah, right. And the fact that, and and Nick knows this with with his wife too, and the fact that his wife understands the sport and the space so much and is so involved in the Mm -hmm. process, that just gives him more motivation to, to do what he wants to accomplish. Right. The, the, so strongman as a sport is definitely going to be in the United States to continue to get the recognition. And Brian's the type mm-hmm. of guy who can go into a boardroom mm-hmm. and represent yes, the strongman community. And, try, you know, like, again, can he get it back on ESPN Live? Can can the show a classic go live on ESPN, even if it's ESPN 2 or ESPN Plus? Yeah. Right. 90% of the people have some type of strength. But that's yeah. turnkey for them. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I mean, it's it's already set up turnkey for yeah. for a live television production, like you know, for the and, whole and thing. Again, and you need the name recognition to accomplish that, which they got you know, that's that's it. as well. You know, and and again, it, it's and how other people like and I and again, Nick and again Nick being in a professional strongman, I look at certain things like how can we as a country in the strongman space get. America's strongest man with the same like worthiness of winning like Britain's strongest man. You, like you go overseas and you listen right. to those guys when they say, like, look at Thor, for example. He was mm-hmm. like 10 times Iceland's strongest man. Mm-hmm. Like, did it really mean that much to you to win that thing 10 times when you're placing on the podium every year at Worlds? Or like, or like Big Z. Now, Big Z's a nut job, right? He, <laughs> he's just competing in there. But I mean, he, he was it. Lithuania's strongest man how many years? Or, like, how important it is for, like, the, the Stoltman brothers to be Britain's strongest man or Europe's strongest man or mm-hmm. Novikov and all those guys. Like, right. uh, you know, when like when I first really dug in, like, I knew about Kazmaier, Bruce Wilhelm, Don Reinhardt, Franco right. Colombo, you know, and all those guys. But really when it started to get popular again in the U.S. was when Philippi and all you guys – it started getting more involved. And when Mark was Mark, Mark being uh, the strength coach at UNLV really started to jump things up. Like my, yep. Mark, myself and Chris Doyle, who was at university of Utah at the time, we, we conceptualized strongman in the college football training in that like 95 to 96 area. Nobody was flipping tires and doing that stuff until mm-hmm. we did it. And we all had our different reasons of doing it. Mark being a competitor, he saw the value me, I saw the value in that full body work and the fact that I was at Boise State at the time with no budget. I could trade a tire guy who had to pay to get his tires recycled a dozen football t shirts and they dump them all off at the football field. <laughs> Heck, they'll just let you take them. It's yeah, 200 bucks. Like, yeah, man, to you got to pay for these things to get dispersed. You want them? Come and get them. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. Like, okay, man, here's some t shirts. Let's go. So, you know, I, I would like to see that from a fan perspective where. Where America, like Bobby Thompson, was America's strongest man, mm-hmm. but yet I only heard that when they announced him. I didn't hear it enough. Yeah, like no. the American nightmare, well, American log press record holder. No, he's the America's strongest man. You hear Pablo Cordiaca, Europe's strongest man. You know, there's a story behind this. You know that, right? No, that's why I'm bringing it up. So Dion Wessels, or Dion Masters now. Um, trademarked America's Strongest Man the day before TWI did, IMG. <laughs> the day before. And has won every lawsuit with it. And in the process um, of them going after each other, they've pretty much dynamited the bridge. <laughs> because at one point, uh, they were going to make America's Strongest Man just like World's Strongest Man for American television. And it, 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 
the destructive thing, nature of what happened oh, in hey, court. As great as our great. country is, that's the thing. As there, there's the thing. It's just like it's just like powerlifting. Oh, mm -hmm. I don't like the rules. Now I got the big house powerlifting association. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> You know, it's the same thing. Like, well, look, even us as strength and conditioning coaches, as a as a unit, there was a National Strength and Conditioning Association. When they got too big and started really going outside of just the coaches, the college coaches got upset and broke off. So now, yeah. like this week, I'm at the College Strength and Conditioning Coaches Association. Ten years later, the National Strength and Conditioning Coaches Association, they don't learn anything. <laughs> Pissed off the high school coaches. Guess where I yeah. go in June? The National High School Strength and Coaches. Conditioning Coaches Association deal. So it, it's just like sometimes we 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 get in the middle of things and don't realize what's best for the profession or what's best mm -hmm. for the sport. Right. And it's hard because, as you guys know, there's several amateur types of associations now, and you got to choose – which one you want to compete in because it's affiliated with something else. Like I'm just still learning that part, but like if you want to go to Giants Live, you got to do official strongman game stuff. Yeah. You do now. Yeah. So yeah. Why yeah. would I do anything else? Because yeah. Giants Live gets me the world's strongest man. Correct. So when you start connecting dots, I gotta be in official strongman games if I want to get to Giants Live, which could catapult me to world's strongest, world's strongest man. man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean it, and it's the same thing like back in the day. I want to be an IPF World Powerlifting Champion. Well, that used to be USPF. Yeah, then it was more. ADFPA slash USA That's Powerlifting. Cool. So now Which you have to go and I was part of the NGB on that, by the way. Oh, were you? I was in the national governing body for Come the Come on, ADFPA. man. What are you doing? You're part of the problem, Nick. Come on, man. <laughs> well, no, no. They, they, The IPF told us in the meeting that they're going to kick the USPF out and then bring us in because they wanted to see it become an Olympic sport. They completely and utterly failed over the last 24 years to get that in and did not hold up their part of the bargain. And yeah. all they've done is destroy the drug testing that ADFPA had back then because the ADFPA, the judges could administer the drug test. Did you know that? Yeah. Oh yeah, I know. So I was an, AD, I was an ADFPA judge. <laughs> yeah, me too. I still got my patch somewhere. You, you, mine, mine's right up here on the wall. Yes, yeah, so I, I got to find mine. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> see, see it right up there? Yep. I got to go yeah. get mine. I got to See, now I got to go get mine and put mine in my gym. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was funny as we could do a, you know, a two-hour drug, drug screen because they just pull, pull the guys randomly out a judge can just come knock on your door and get your drug test. You can't do well, that. And, and, well, and the other thing, too, is that you knew most of the judges knew the athletes, and even if they were allegedly drug-free, they knew which ones were actually drug-free, and they'd pull them so they wouldn't have any failed tests. <laughs> well, I don't know. They they tested me out of contest three different times. Yeah. It's, it, yeah <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, the, the, the IPF would do that. The IPF, the first year we got in, I think Brad had to compete. Brad Gillingham had to compete against – he got third that year in the super heavyweights and the top two guys had just come off of drug suspensions and didn't get tested, but he did. Yeah. You know, these are things I remember is. Oh know, yeah. I mean, well, and, and you know that it's, and then as you know, I think the athletes and their teams are always going to be smart enough to come up with the thing, the next big drug that oh. does. And again, this is a, now we're digging into a little deeper deal, but that's where <laughs> I've always said where, and again, this is a personal, not a professional. This is just my personal. Everybody's got a choice. But the one thing that I've had a hard time wrapping my head around was when you hear about, and, and again, I, I could see both sides, but when you hear so-and-so lost his medal because he got caught for a, 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 a compound that wasn't able to be tested 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you see some of that and you're like, yeah, man, that's they're keeping the tech. First of all, they're, they're keeping the stuff that long tells you mm -hmm. that. But well, it's like, man, that's a big that's a big, interesting fact to see how both people respond to that. The person who moves up to get the medal and then the mm -hmm. person who loses the medal for. And again, a lot of times we know overseas, half those athletes didn't know what they were getting. Yeah, I read true. a book. I read a book. Uh, I don't know where it is in one of my libraries it's called Fool's Gold about the East German women's swim team. 
and and the things that those young women didn't know what was happening to them, and then the repercussions when they were adults. Yeah, kind of scary. Like, mm-hmm. it's kind of scary. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's crazy. It's like that movie, uh, that movie Icarus, where they had to do all those crazy yes. things for. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And it's just like, what is you know? And they and the Olympics keep it that long, and then well, they, like said, the crazy thing is, is, if they're going to go back and do that. Now I watch Bigger, Stronger, Faster. Did you guys? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. When they talked about the race in the Olympics, where. Oh, yeah. Carl Lewis ends up getting the gold medal and then mm-hmm. they still have the samples and they retest it and they said everybody in that race but one guy yeah. would fail and it wasn't Carl Lewis? Yeah. I mean, oh, no. it's like, it's... that really makes you question. So if you're going to go back and do that, then go back and do it for everything that you have all the way back. Mm-hmm. Or don't it, do it that, at all. That, that's all, and again, that's a, a, you know, that's a lot of people have moral dilemma with that. and And I guess for me, being around sport as much as I've been around. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I mean, I, Lyle Alzado was, went to high school, same high school as me. He was a couple of years younger than my, mm-hmm. than I'm a huge Raider fan. So I know, yeah. <laughs> I, I know there. Lyle. I trained with Lyle in high school and I, you know, I know, you know, I'm not stupid, man. I, I, I had a really good support system when I was in high school. So I'm not an idiot. I know what's going on, but I, I really believe that, and again, maybe this is more from a personal standpoint. He doesn't get the credit he deserves for what he accomplished on the football field. Like they didn't mm-hmm. keep sacks and record until he actually was like two years after, two years before he retired. But right. unofficially, he has over a hundred sacks in his career that nobody yeah. knows about. Yeah. He in some ways, he's a legitimate ability to possibly be a Hall of Famer. Mm-hmm. But because he said what he said out loud. And I d- totally disagree with his thought process of he, he, this is why he was who he was because when in high school, he was uh, from his upbringing, he was always a fighter. He was always pretty much a nut job. And you could say what you want about the, the steroids and this and that. But the one thing that steroids don't change is how hard you work. Mm-hmm. Very true. And when I saw that guy in the gym training with me and my dad, you can't – steroids don't make people work hard. Yeah. Nope. If anything, most guys who take steroids stop working hard because they think they're going to get the extra kick from from that. So right. it's a it's – a, again, we're probably delving into things. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's okay. An, it's it's yeah. an education thing for me. Mm-hmm. And that's why sometimes I don't mind talking about it because it's an mm-hmm. education thing. True. I'm not recommending it. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not, you know, I, I, I hate when I hear these younger high school kids and, you know, hell, man, you don't even need creatine because you don't eat right, you don't sleep right, and you don't work hard enough. And exactly. Most of you don't, and you, most of them don't know how to lift with proper technique. Uh, so it's, um, it's, a cra- it's crazy to see that. But what the one thing, like, when you watch these guys, like, a, like an Alzado, and they come out, I think some of it is their testimony – because they mm-hmm. know, and they're trying to, again, I, I think a lot of what he was trying to do was be a deterrent to right. younger athletes mm-hmm. saying, and trying to put all of what he accomplished was on this and why he got sick. He was on that. Because if you remember, he was retired. And when he made that comeback, mm-hmm. is up until that point, I don't think he ever experimented with GH. And when he started training with Hatfield and getting all into the ex- plyometric work and the really a totally different because he was just a banger. He was an old school lift heavy. Yeah, and, <laughs> he's getting in there hitting stuff. it. So now he's trying to catch up a little bit because he's forty plus years old. I think he thought that that was the reason why it occurred. But you know, I, I don't like anything else. The, the the hard part with everything that goes on is in anything there's use and abuse. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the critical factor. It's uh, no different than drinking alcohol, uh, eating too much, mm. not eating enough. Not, <laughs> yep, not sleeping. No, sleeping enough. Yeah, there's just certain <laughs> things that all come into play. But the one thing that I always admired about Lyle was, and, I, and this is why I was, regardless of what you knew or didn't know, the dude worked like he was oh, getting yeah. cut yeah. every day. 
And I and that's something I took to myself was mm-hmm. I just got I'm not as talented as these guys. I just got to outwork them, and hopefully that'll pay off. <laughs> and, and, well, then it the does. Other, and the other thing was people don't realize how much he gave back. Like if you if you know a lot of his story, he gave always he always gave back to the kids. Always. He, I, he I, I got coached by him at offense, defense, football yeah. camp. He did he did uh, a lot of things when he was in Denver with Special Olympics. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of that was his way of being wholeheartedly because of the family situation he drove, he grew up in was not that. Mm-hmm. It was quite mm-hmm. the opposite. So – it, it, it was interesting because uh, I remember when he got traded to the Raiders, we were playing intramural softball at PS number two. He drives up in his, uh, at that time, it was that two seat Mercedes SL <laughs> convertible. And he, he pulls me over and says, I just got traded to the Raiders. And he was upset. I was like, that's a hell of a lot better than the Browns. And, <laughs> and he went on to win his Super Bowl and get comeback yeah. player of the year. And, mm-hmm. And things like that. So it's it's just funny how you you remember certain stories and and how things resonate because it all starts with just having good support systems across and trying to figure out ways to to do things and and, and learning life lessons. Yeah. And that and and that's why I think you know sports can help enhance that if you're if you're somebody mm-hmm. who's a sporting athlete or somebody who's promotes sports or you're kids are in sports i think you can learn more mm-hmm. and you always like anything else right once it's over you really find out how much that stuff helps you like i watch my oldest son and and how his journey in life is has been and there's a lot of things that i can see now that he was listening <laughs> yeah, yeah they might want, not be paying attention they but have, they're they listening they might have wanted us to know it <laughs> yeah like it like and then my and then my youngest son totally different totally different journey so mm-hmm. again you just uh like anything else man you just try to go out there every day and figure out what's right and be humble enough to know that you're not perfect and mm-hmm. can you can you look in the mirror and do a pretty good job of self self-criticism because that's hard too and to know what your faults and weaknesses are mm-hmm. and if and you're willing to we're willing to progress and you know, and just be authentic. I mean, I'm like, that's one thing that you just got to be upfront and authentic because what you see now in this day and age of uh, showtime versus go time versus no time is yeah. with, with the way people are, yeah. it's interesting to watch their expressions, right? If, if I see somebody on social media doing these outrageous things, well, when I meet you in person behind closed doors, you better be outrageous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you know what I mean, right? Yeah. Like, uh, don't be that guy who, oh, it's time for me to shoot social media. Let me pop some high high energy drinks and go out there and go psycho. And then 10 minutes after that, you're worn out sleeping <laughs> on the couch. Uh, just if you if you are if you're a go if you a go timer, then be go time 24-7. Mm-hmm. If you're a no timer, then be a no timer twenty four seven. There's nothing wrong with that, and and we're we're in that we're in that age where uh, people are looking for that personal recognition. Yeah, yes. and uh, I, I've I've always said I've been very very like I said honored with the personal recognitions I've achieved, but all of that achievement is based off of the work and the abilities of the staff I've had. And the mm-hmm. athletes I coached. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I'm doing this stuff by myself, there is no personal achievement. There is no meeting Brian Shaw when he's a young kid out of college who says he wants to be a strength coach to find out, you know, six and a half months later that he's got a different dream. And he was mm-hmm. smart enough and um, cerebral enough, even at that age, to really realize that if he was going to pursue pursue this thing that he couldn't get out of his head that the hours and commitment of the career he was looking to get in at some point it was you're going to have to make a choice and that was one of the discussions that tom and i had Uh. because tom's in a very he's in a tough profession to succeed if it's not an ideal situation and the Mm. great thing for tom is he has a coach that coached him in college Mm -hmm. So understands, and as me and Tom discussed, 
he's still at a point now where he's an assistant. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's not yeah. all, it doesn't fall on his shoulders. So at some point in time, like another friend of mine, another colleague and another, it, it seems like I, I've had, well, he didn't make, but I've coached with four guys, two wound up getting us. Well, you know, one of them, uh, Corey St. Clair, yeah. he was an right. intern of mine at, and on my powerlifting team at Boise State. Wow. And then, so he wound up getting his pro card when he was doing those super series with Ode yep. and those guys in uh in, in know, that's, Beach how I met, that. that's how I met Corey. Yeah, so the he series. still has uh, – when we used to go down to the river and pick up stones for the weight room, he still has the original 218-pound stone. He can't, He's the one who took it, and he still has it. So it's kind of <laughs> – it's kind of cool, but when you see these guys, it's like you got – it's a diversity. It's when do you make this break? And so yeah. with Brian realized the commitment as an intern, let alone now I'm going to promote you to graduate assistant. So now there's more more entails mm -hmm. that. And then if you keep working up, hey, if I wind up being a head guy, there ain't a whole lot of sport coach. Like if you're in a football game – Ain't no – if you're a head strength coach, you ain't going up to uh, – in September 20th and saying, Coach, uh, in October 15th is the Rogue Invitational. Uh, I'm not going to be here for that weekend's game. Well, you might as well pack up for the Rogue and stay at the Rogue. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, right. so in Tom's case, he's in a really good situation. And yeah. my buddy John Heck, who chose to go the coaching route and took an NFL job, but when he was in college, the coach that he worked for, uh, Coach Hess – understood what his goals and aspirations were and because he was an assistant yeah if you need to compete we'll work it out and go sure but when you have to get to that point where now you gotta choose you, you gotta choose it's gonna be uh it's hard and, and and luckily for me like meeting tom and and again i didn't know tom till the shaw classic last year but obviously he knew mm -hmm. who i was and so we hit mm -hmm. it off right away and and I don't, I don't want to say I'm a mentor, but if I'm somebody because I understand the situation mm -hmm. that him and his wife can reach out to and, and get my opinion, I, I feel like, you know, that I'm cool. I like, I think that's cool, right? Like mm -hmm. yeah. you have, there's somebody out there that he knows understands exactly what I'm going through because he saw it right. and can give me a perspective that a lot of people can't. And that's what yeah. you, that's what you hope to do by, uh, building the relationships. But I, like I said, like in Tom, we'd be interested to see because he has athleticism because obviously he played football. Yeah. But when I watch him and I look at where his potential could be, cause he's still young. Does he fit the podium of world's strongest man better than the Shaw classic, the rogue or the, or, or the Arnold right now? I'm like, well, those events there, I can see him podium on. Yeah. If they continue to go athletic, nothing. I'm not saying he couldn't, but right now, this that would be my challenge to him. I know you're going to podium in the strong events. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think if he doesn't gain any weight, yeah, that's what I'm and thinking. He stays he watch where out he, how he is he too big. and leans mm -hmm. that down and works on speed, does some jumping rope stuff yeah. like that, where your feet are fast. You know, um, well, and you know that that's what we worked with Brian the last two years was footwork. Yeah, speed. I mean, foot, we're bringing up six-inch mini hurdles and just working mm -hmm. on pivots and how can we be more efficient in plants and pivots. And he, and again, especially it showed up this year. A lot of things we worked on last year showed up this year. His yeah. deadlift, he, 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 he's getting closer and closer to the Brian Shaw deadlift we know, mm -hmm. and his footwork and his conditioning at that at that body weight yeah. is pretty phenomenal. It's impressive. For Forty years yeah. old. It's it's nuts and. <laughs> I don't, I, I, I don't think it, I, I think a couple of the events getting thrown into different spots, like the first one. Oh yeah. The rain uh, completely threw off the, the, the first day of finals. Of, yeah. And again, but it, every, made a couple, everybody had to go through it. Right. Like, yeah, but like true. we said, yeah. the older athletes, the cerebral deliberate deliberateness of what they're doing mm -hmm. and how they're prepping mm -hmm. is different than the 26 year old athlete who's like, Oh, it's raining. Big deal. Or and then Crazy. again, and they're not thinking about it like, well, that didn't live up to my expectations. Now I got to chase this in event two. Well, right. that didn't go to cost. Now I really got to bring it in event three. Well, that right. didn't go to cost. Now I've lost 
Now I can't make up enough points in day two. Right. And, and then it just keeps ding, ding. Yeah. It's like yeah. you're just getting jabbed in the head, jabbed yeah. in the head, and now you can't shut it off. And that's – hey, and, I, and I'm and i 100% like that myself. Like mm -hmm. the other day, man, I'm at this conference. I wake up at 3 in the morning, and I'm thinking about what's going on, and I didn't need to get up till 5.30. Well, I'm up at 3. And, yeah. and, and, you know, you're trying to lay around, get back to sleep. Before you know it, you're like, just get up. Start the day, right? So I'm down in the pool at four o'clock doing mobility work in the pool and stretching on the deal and and off you go. And that's the and that's a tough part for the the older athlete who's continuing to chase greatness at the highest levels. It's mm -hmm. it's something to really learn and, and hopefully individuals who continue to get into the high levels that start getting into what I call the submasters age of 35 plus start to realize how much more the mental comes into play mm -hmm. and then 40 45 50 55 it really starts to you know yeah. really hit you it's um again these are just i kind of had to do that on the fly continue to learn man and you, and you mm -hmm. have to be willing to accept certain things yes like I, like, that like I've you know nick like again what you're doing in the and the ability to maintain how you're doing is is exceptional like, I, like, in, like in Brian's case, I, I used to go back like with the deadlift. Everybody's like, is Brian ever going to deadlift like he used to? Well, when you've deadlifted a 1,000 pounds as many times as he has, that catches up to you. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like Eddie Cohn said, and I always go back to it. You only got so many max effort lifts in your life. Save them. <laughs> and, the, and, the and the problem is when you're in World's Strongest Man, you can't save them. Nope. Because because for every one rep max you do, there's a tax. But then for yeah. every competitive event you're in that has a repetition max, that adds up accumulation too. Like, mm -hmm. again, I thought repetitions was beneficial to Brian at this point in his career than a pure one rep max in this in the world's strongest man setup. Yeah. yeah. And and it did. He had his two of his best the two best events mm -hmm. he had overall were the two deadlifts. Right. I know he didn't really he was a little disappointed with the number in the finals, but compared to everybody else, it was a very good number. Yeah, it was a great number. You know, so, but to me, I felt like that was a better situation than if he would have had to have done a max because for any other reason is everybody else is a really good deadlifter. And, mm. and now 900 to 1,000, everybody does that. You, you, you mm. kind of shrug your shoulders, but you know, well, in, yeah, Nick, in the top you remember 10. when 880 was, you know, that, oh, oh, my God, someone deadlifted 900. Yeah. And now, if you don't yeah. deadlift 900, you're in trouble. Like, you're coming in, mm -hmm. you're losing mega, mega points. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If if you're not pulling probably 940, 950 now um, from the floor, yeah, you're like going to give up enough points where you're not going to be able yeah. to make, maybe not even make the podium, but you won't win. See, and then, like, for me, that's why, like, going into the Shaw Classic, I think Brian, based off of where he's at deadlift-wise, I think he will be very, very happy with the number he pulls this year because mm. he's such in a better place mentally, physically, mm. technically. I mean, again, when you get older, injuries, they may be corrected, but they always linger in the back of your head. Mm, is yeah. this the rep that's going to go again? Is this the rep that's going to go again? Is this the rep that's going to go again? And then you got to shake it off real quick. Like, hey, you can't think like that. Your hands are strapped in. <laughs> That'll be one of the – that that is I'll, – I'll say this now. That is one of the hardest things to get out of your head um, when you go to grab a hold of the bar, like <laughs> after tearing my lat off. Um, it It took some mental will – and then you just at some point you have to go okay i know it's solid right. i've been doing block pulls with over a thousand it's still mm -hmm. there so i'm gonna i'm just gonna pull from the ground yep and i'm just gonna but pull it, but it took but it took you how many times of pulling block pulls to feel like okay well, my mind's right i can probably three or four months run. yeah I mean, probably three just, or four months it's hard man it's just you know and then now it's gonna be the same thing with my abdomen coming right. back from the kidney thing is I, I pulled 485 for 20 last week, which was great. I said, once I get to 500 for 20, I'll start pulling singles. I think 485 is close enough. 
Yeah. So I'll probably go up and pull like 600 for three this week just to start getting used to that. And now I'm going to throw them the block pulls every week. I did 700. And the first rep, I was like really nervous pulling on it. <laughs> I didn't grab that thing a pull with everything I had. I pulled enough to get the bar moving and then just kept waiting to feel anything. And when I got to the top and didn't feel anything, then I just went, okay, and then did nine more. Right. Yeah. So, it, well, I know. I mean, I, 135 on the deadlift. As soon as I go in, I'm like, all right, dude, you better lock in because a lot more people get hurt in the warm up weights yeah. rather than yeah. the max left. Yeah. So for me, well, it's like, and if and, the, and I'm like, if you watch me on a squat, like 135 and 405, they look exactly the same insane. because I'm taking that thing. I'm like a super eccentrically concentrated guy because I got to make sure it is on. We even on dynamic effort. <laughs> like that's why I tell people my dynamic effort scores on a velocity based training device will always be slower because I won't negate an eccentric focus because i know like my whole process on a squat is i got a five count descent <laughs> before i'm going and i don't care what weight it is i don't right. care if it's to a box or not that's just my thought because i know if i can maintain that eccentric strength i know when i get to the time for transition it's coming up like i'm not getting stuck Right. Well, the other thing, though, is how much research is there done on the fact that if you're going down fast to stop that and get it going back the other way, you're multiplying the weight times the speed. So at the bottom, you could have to push out with 900 pounds on an 800 pound squat. Oh, yeah. Whereas there's a if, lot of that. And, you know, if it's that overcoming eccentrics. Yep. And, that, and if you that go down whole, super uh, slow and then explode out, you're only stopping 800 pounds yeah. at the bottom. And again, in powerlifting, although, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, the explosiveness and the maximum, you know, concentric acceleration and all the stuff with Louie with the uh, circa max phase with the, because, you know, a lot of, you know, and it's a little bit different than like jump, like the faster counter movement you have in a jump, the higher you're going to jump. And there's some relationship to like on dynamic effort, the faster you go down, hold on. The faster you go down, allegedly, the faster you'll come up. But that's a totally different component than, to me, of maintaining a sturdy, upright posture. Because a lot of times we we forget that, to, to, to me, it's about focus, like focusing mm -hmm. on technique. Right. And a lot of times you, you have technique breaks when you overemphasize speed of movement on the eccentric in in a strength lift and again I, i'm i don't want to talk and get myself un out educated <laughs> by somebody who listens but the only the only athlete that i ever saw squat that didn't break form who was extremely fast on the way down on the way up and it translated to when he went over to olympic lifting was shane hammond i never saw a guy go down that fast with that kind of load and maintain technique through the whole thing. Uh, I, that guy, it, it almost looked, people called it the dive bomb technique. That guy yeah. dive bombed a thousand and came up like it was a dynamic effort. And I used Damn. to laugh because oh, yeah. you know, the, the old nuts. Olympic, when he went into the Olympic weightlifting realm and they would show him clips of doing like 705 for like five by five and it looked like 225 and people were just amazed. And I was like, you got to remember that's 70% of his max. Mm -hmm. Number one, <laughs> yeah. and 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 that's the reason why he was able to. And and back then that was a little different because, uh, and I don't know how much it's changed in the USA, but they used to do all their squats and accessory work based off percentages of max of their competition lift. So, like, and again, this number sh should be fairly close to correct, but like, you would never really you would set your training max on a back squat like off of one hundred and twenty percent of your cleaning jerk. So if you had really or fr or front something in that no no no, but if you look at it from guys like Shane Hammond, that would have been under fifty percent of his max. Right. And I think that's one of the things where, uh, if you guys know Travis Mash, what he's done with his guys and his women, in his in on his team was he took some of those components of powerlifting, and brought it into his weightlifting team. And if you watch a lot of his weightlifters, now I do think in, in, in that sport, 
there is a point of no return where if you continue to get stronger in a squat, it's not really going to make a difference. Right. And we saw that with one of his one of his athletes who was a really good squatter. Uh, he's now with a different coach, but I've watched him continue to evolve. Where he squats generally hundred pounds less than what he usually does in training, mm-hmm. but his he's the second rated American is probably going to go to the twenty twenty four Olympics. Damn, because Jeez. his competitive lifts are up. So mm-hmm. that's where you have to play the game. But I felt like when Travis kind of broke that mold of, we still got to be strong. Right. Like his guys always came out of the hole explosive in the front squat. Like. Uh, I would say a high percentage of Travis Masters athletes will never miss a clean. They may miss a jerk for various reasons, but if they catch it, if they catch a clean, they're there's a, there's a high percentage they're coming out. Same thing with the snatch. So I think there's a lot of components, and that's why, I like, when people used to get on Louie for bash and weightlifting, mm-hmm. I, he I think he had some realistic components when you studied the way weightlifting in US, USA trained. They really didn't train max effort work. Right. They were very, very good in technique. They were yep. very, very good in training the movement, but the accessory stuff, and I believe this to be true. And I'm not, and I've delved a little bit into the weightlifting world early in my career with some state level competitors. Is yeah, we don't, we're not strong enough to do what we need to do to get to the numbers these other comp- these other organizations and federations across the world are doing. You know, and it's just like everybody tries to replicate stuff. I saw a really good American coach, and he played college football, Tim Swords. He was dissecting Lasha's technique in the clean and jerk. And, mm-hmm. and Lasha, if you look at him fundamentally based off of what it should look like, he's got several minor flaws. His okay. uh, his upper body, his upper back thoracic is, is a little bit uh, low, rounded more than it should. He's got a little bit more elbow bend. And everybody's teaching the Lasha pull because this guy's the greatest lifter right now in the world. Right. There's a reason why, because he's got other genetic factors that make him, plus he's, you know, 400 pounds. So, you know, a 132 pound person shouldn't be learning a loss of pull. And really no one should be learning a loss of pull. It's just like Brian Shaw's deadlift. Any strong man who mimics Brian Shaw's deadlift technique, if he's not six, eight, 400 yeah. plus pounds with the same hip width as Brian Shaw and the rule state, you have to do a conventional style deadlift. You shouldn't deadlift like Brian Shaw. Right. Because when you really look at it, and, I'm, and we, me and Brian have talked like this, it's almost a modified sumo without being a, but you can't put your hands in between your legs. Right. Yeah. I'll, and, I'll agree with that. I mean, you know, and, and again, as, and if you watch as he got wider and wider and wider, he had to find natural position. So that's one thing that we had to learn. <laughs> When when we were when I first got hired, whatever you want to say, when I first got brought on to the team, the big thing was we got to get this guy's confidence up and get this hamstring thing cleaned up. And Nick, you were out there early. He's doing hip thrusts. Yep. He's doing revert. I mean, sh- sh- uh, RDLs off the vert pull. I yep. mean, he's doing stuff that he, sumo deadlifts. Like everybody was yep. like, why? Because we had to build all these muscles that he never activated because he's doing the same thing. So for as long mm-hmm. as he'd been lifting, we're exposing him to exercises he's never done before. Right. That takes time. It's mm-hmm. like That's I a- tell people, you don't mess with greatness even if the technique doesn't look biomechanically correct. And that's what we found out. We had improved so much stuff that Brian's technique had actually improved to a point where it wasn't efficient for who Brian Shaw was. He would pull himself into position and you'd be like, holy shit, that looks like a textbook. Problem was, it wasn't good for his mechanics, so we right. had to get him into the him perfect into Brian Shaw technique, right. which a year later <laughs> was there. It, it was mm-hmm. it was good to go, and and that's where you look at certain things, and and we were fortunate that we had, you know, what we would call prep. I call developmental phases because Brian doesn't compete like these other guys. Mm-hmm. If, if Brian would compete like these other guys. I don't know if we're able to do that type of rebuild. Right. Because we wouldn't have had enough time to invest legitimate training time for those responses to elicit the necessary improvements that he needed. And and that's the great part about training. Like now, it'll be interesting to see how some of these other guys, like like I watch some of these other guys 
And I know they got coaches, and believe me, I'm not proposing myself as a strongman coach. I'm a strength and conditioning coach that can help strongman. And that's what mm-hmm. I've learned with Brian. Like this year, uh, it's like anything else. I, I believe that a strength and conditioning coach with my experience mm-hmm. definitely has a niche and a a role training a high-level strongman competitor. But there is also a need for an event coach. It's like a position coach. Mm-hmm. Or some and like so for me, uh, and 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 you have to know your athlete enough, and you have to be confident in your own ability to tell your coach. Like last year, I thought Brian was too coachable. Mm-hmm. He didn't give me enough information. Like after after the after the competition and his debrief, well, I used to do this. I said, man, if you would have told me that, I work for you. <laughs> tell me what we got. I'll write it yeah. in. That's mm-hmm. my job. So this year. We really did a better job of that. Like, all right, Brian, mm-hmm. I'm the strength and conditioning coach. You're the head coach and event coach. I'll right. help with the volumes and the loadings and things based off what you tell me, or and I'll give you my feedback. And you got to agree on it. Don't if I give you the script and you don't agree with it, then tell me now nah, I can't do that. Yeah, and that's where yeah. I thought happened a little bit. Year one was he had I don't it almost like he respected who I was and what my role was too much. But if you know Brian, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So we cleared that up right away. And it was, like I said, it really worked out. And that allowed me to learn more from the technique. Like the one the one event now, I feel like I can be very helpful for the high-level strongman competitor. Definitely a uh, novice. Like mm-hmm. I, I really feel confident in training a novice coming up. Because their improvements are not going to be because of me. They're going to be just because they're a novice coming up. But with the high level guys, I think I have enough information now where I can provide bi- valuable feedback. The one, the one, the one that I still really got to wrap my head around is the circus dumbbell because it's so much like an Olympic lift mm-hmm. that it doesn't matter if it's a hundred pounds or four hundred pounds. It's technique. It's yeah. it's 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 bar path. It's mm-hmm. it's so it it could be the difference of. Is the circus dumbbell round? Is it square plate loaded? Oh, it's the size of the grip. Mm-hmm. So I was Which, I, even with yeah. me, like I mess around with it. So like for me, I start going out because I got uh, York circus dumbbells. Mm-hmm. So I put fat grips around them. Yeah, right. And I'm trying, you know, and again, for me, I'm just playing, you know, I got 50, 60, 70, 80 pounds, and I'm like, this is a effed up. You gotta really learn how to <laughs> get this. Just, like it's I positioning just, without blowing yeah, up your elbow. If you got, yeah. It's all where does it fit? Mm-hmm. It's a different tricep movement. Oh, yeah. And so when I'm like studying the overhead press work, I don't I'd be interested to sit down with the guys who if you if you got it, you got it. It doesn't matter how you train. But there's some uniqueness to the log and the overhead press and strongman where I'd like to see how some of these guys do direct tricep work and what exercises they they script at different time. That was one of the things that I was really trying to dial in with this this cycle with Brian. And, and in training, it looked like a lot of things we did from the tricep specific work tied in. And again, in, in the the display, his dis I'm not disappointed in the display of work because it, it when you when you when your athlete says I had that's all I had, that's all you got. Then that's just right. the way it is. If you tell me you went out there. And man, I just didn't. I could have gone harder. No, I'm pissed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Hey, man, if you got, if you gave me everything you can, yeah. and your best was tenth, we were ten pellets in that event. That's just the way it is. Like, right. that's it. You know. And again, you could kick yourself in the ass, and oh, uh, you know, I didn't have my breath right, or I didn't do this. The only thing is, did you give it the best you had? Mm-hmm. Right. Because that's all you can ask from anyone. Because the other stuff you can learn, you know, if it's mm-hmm. technique. That's just the way it goes. Sometimes you miss a lift on technique. How many guys mm-hmm. get their first attempt in a squat, three reds, because they tried to cut it or something happened because they were nervous it was the first attempt of the meet, and mm-hmm. then they still come back and squat 100 pounds more because they dial it in. Right. The problem is on certain events in Strongman, you're not getting a repeat. Yeah, that's very true. You know what I'm saying? You're not going out, hell, you know, you know we had a little hiccup in the Conan's wheel. Oh, we're going to get a second attempt. No, you're not. <laughs> nope, you're done. You come in fifth out of sixth. <laughs> game over yeah. on to the next event so yeah i just 
again, I keep going back. If there's the things that I want to resonate with coaches are just remember what your role is like. And this is no, everybody's got their reasonings. Like for me, I'm, I like being in the background. Like Mm -hmm. I want to be around, but I know if I'm not around every day, I can't be around every, every minute of the day during game day. Yeah. That makes sense. Like you got to let the, the people who are there, I want to touch you, make sure you're cool, hang around a little bit and get away. Now, if I was in the room every day, like James was, or mm-hmm, like, bro. or, or is in the twice a week, Steve and them guys, mm. maybe I would find myself being more involved. And that's where I have to, that's the night. That's the real tough thing for you, for a high level coach working with high level athletes from, from a TV screen mm-hmm. is true. You can't put more pressure on the guy in competition by now, all of a sudden, you're feeding him with stuff that you're not right. feeding him five days a week. Like, right. Nick knows how I coach Brian virtually. Mm-hmm. A couple of times a week, I'm going to get on, but I'm only on for the one thing I want to watch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. We talk, see you, have a great workout. Right. Because I don't need to see the other stuff. Well, I well, should, but I shouldn't. But I just It's know also what four hours. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know what events I want to see on Saturday, and mm-hmm. I know I want to watch a deadlift. Mm-hmm. All the accessory stuff, tell me your feedback, tell me what you think, make adjustments, and on the fly. So I cannot be there for every minute of the day in competition, and now this guy's like, because I don't know what he's thinking. Fucking house, now all of a sudden he's here all the time. You know, I don't need to walk out to the event with you. I don't I, I don't mind being where I'm at, but I also want to know that I do have the opportunity where I got to go make sure this guy's all right and then get yeah. the hell out of there. Yeah, Which, and, that, and like, that's where I, I think like try to do the same. Some people on coaching staffs, mm-hmm. and this is for coaches who, and again, this is not to criticize. Mm-hmm. I think these are learning opportunities for this new age of coaching. When you're coaching from afar, and then you show up at an event to handle or be there to support your athlete, how you coached him or her for those 16 weeks of prep is how you have to be available for those days of competition. Mm-hmm. And that's why, again, like the one thing I I really said last year was, and I, I can't remember how it all came about. And I don't know if I approached Brian first or whatever, because I didn't know how they do coaches passes and fam. Yeah. I didn't know any of that. And I was very, very upfront and said, look, man, I'm not there with you every day. I I don't I don't need to be. I said, if whether it's James or Kerry, whoever needs that, be there and handle you and understands that. Yeah. I don't need to be a rookie trying to figure out how to get you handled yeah. uh, on these events. And that's when obviously James being with him as long as he has, James does a great job. He knows exactly how Brian's temperament is. He knows when to get the Gatorade. He knows when to get the tacky. He knows when to do this. I'm still learning that. That's a learning process for me. So that's their role. My role is be there afterwards for a quick debrief, give them the mental support, make sure to keep it positive, talk a little bit about what he's thinking going into day one, and then see you later. I, again, it, it's just here's here's what it is. Uh, this is what I learned for the Panthers, Ron Rivera. A lot of cool stuff I've learned from Coach. Know your role, manage your expectations. If you weren't on, nice. if you weren't, if you weren't in the room, sixteen straight weeks every single day, you don't need to be <laughs> out out in the forefront. Everybody knows who coached them. Mm-hmm. And 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 again, I wonder a lot of times how the athlete. Now, a younger athlete might not give a shit. Other athletes be like, "Hey, man, I know you're my coach, but now all of a sudden you want to be on TV with me." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Again, that's me. Mm, I right. I'm not speaking, or I'm not disregarding anybody's thought process on how they coach their athletes. Right. I just know that it's something for people to be aware of. It's how yes. you, you know, how you want these athletes to build their relationships with you because. Mm. As social media grows, I don't care what anyone says. Sometimes these athletes like, oh, now you want, now you're piggybacking me. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? For sure. Like, hey, man, you weren't with me for 16 weeks. I'm glad you're here and you're, but 
I don't need yeah. anybody holding my hand right now. I, I think the experienced athletes, though, will say that. You know, it, it's the inexperienced ones that it's going to get in their head and mess up that won't. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I've had people come in and help me at powerlifting meets that don't normally train with me and stuff like that. And for the most part, I'm like, guys, I'm pretty easy to deal with. It's just if I turn around and need something from you, just be there. Yep. Right. Other than that, if – you know, I'll I'll turn and ask you a direct question if I feel I need some. If you see me doing something fatally wrong, open your mouth. If it's not, and it's what I've been doing, mm -hmm. and it's going to get through everything, we're good to go. Just when I turn and need you, just be there. That's all, that's all I can ask for. But I think, too, in, in this day and age of conflict and people not liking conflict, mm -hmm. sometimes people are thinking that and don't understand that they should tell the individual, this is what I need from you. Yeah, yeah I, I just like because I got that, that's one thing I this do not have a problem. With. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this just is what I, I need turn, from you. Yep, let's go. And and Very again, different. I just well, and like me and you, Nick, we've talked too. Like I, I mean, it would be real hard for me to coach multiple high level competitors in the same competition. Oh yeah, because you can't focus on. It, I mean, mm -hmm. it's it'd be really really hard for those who do it. Kudos. I don't know how you separate who you're pulling for. Versus who you're yeah. not. <laughs> it's, it's a tough decision. Because if you end up with two guys in the finals, what do you do? Yeah, I mean, yep. unless or, they're going or two guys in the stone off. Yeah. You know, and again, I know there's a lot of guys that do that. More power to them. I, I know that <clears throat> I kind of, I talked to Steve Foshin about this, about different ways. It, a lot of it would be when you started with them. Mm -hmm. Like if someone, like, you know, again, after the Shaw Classic, if somebody at the high level said, House, I'd like you to work for me, that would be easy. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, if, if Brian continues to go and wants me part of the team, I can't work with anybody. Now, I have no problem with throwing some, hey, what do you think? But yeah. I can't be a part because that's who I am as a coach. I'm always going to try to help. Mm -hmm. uh, right. I don't have an issue with that. But then the other thing is, okay, say now I, I start coaching three or four up-and-comers. And now they're climbing the ladder together. They train with me the whole nine yards, right? They're, we're, we're like this. Well, now, me, my thought has already been, okay, if I got these dudes or women, it doesn't matter, if I got there and they're climbing and it looks like they're going to – all three of these dudes could be in the show at the same time. I already know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going to find, or I, hopefully I'll have three people on my staff. Okay, mm -hmm. you're assigned to Nick. You're assigned to Angry Dad. <laughs> yeah. You're assigned to Big House. And yeah. If they all make it to the show, you're his coach because I'm in the stands. I'm just there. I'm not talking to anyone mm -hmm. at all because I have to remove myself from the situation and let them guys know that I love all of you. But for these four days, mm -hmm. that's your coach. <laughs> that's it. Right. I'm rooting for all of you yeah. to do yeah. the best that you can do. I'm rooting for all of you because if, if you all make the podium, man, I look really, really good. But, <laughs> yeah. but in the that's end, true. these are the guys who are going to handle you. These are the guys you debrief with. These are you guys. And then those three guys I would talk to. Yeah. Right. I would debrief with the coaching staff because at that point in time, I'm coaching the coaches. Yeah. Right. You know, and that and that's one thing that again, um that's my that's my cerebral that that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, there could be coaches right now saying that guy's full of it. That's right. I'm full of it to you because you got your opinion, you got your mm -hmm. style, and it's worked for you. That's it. Uh, for me, I, I just know and, and it's like team sports. I got talked to a couple of my buddies with the XFL. They go, they all coach two teams each. Well, how's Man. that work? Like yeah. and I talked to the one and the one said well, I've got different assistants for both. So the one assistant's on one sideline, the one assistant's on the other side, and he's kind of like walking back or forth. And I'd be like, hell, I'd be in the box. Yeah. Like if I had that situation. <laughs> yeah, everyone's got I, earpieces in. Yeah. Tell me what's going on. I'd be in the press box because that that's a real interesting dynamic there. Wow. Yeah, coaching is, uh, you know, yeah. you know, no one – everybody needs a coach. Yeah. Co coaches can't coach themselves. Like even me, I, I, uh, I, I wish I had – I train by myself, and but like when I really need help, I know who I can lean on. 
Mm. Uh, Jesse Burdick, do you, uh, you guys know Jesse? Uh, mm-hmm. Jesse is someone that I lean on a lot. He's always helped me technically on some stuff and just a really good guy. Um, he, he would be one for sure. And then I've got, I use my buddy, Big John, because John's watched me train for a lot of times where I can get some good feedback from him and he's stronger than me. So he knows back in the day. I mean, Dave Tate helped me out a lot, a lot. Mm-hmm. Jim Wendler. I mean, Dave, it doesn't sound like a lot, but Dave helped write and design the program that got me to squat my best ever squat and competition 650 Man. and I, he he had and i tore my tricep on that too so that's kind oh, of funny how that works but how, he, how, I, don't how ask, I don't even know like well, the crazy thing is is uh missy Anoki did that yeah I, yeah i don't know right. i mean all i know is about three quarters way up i hear this pack of firecrackers go up in my tricep and the first thing i'm thinking is do not take your bar arm off this bar. Or you will not get credit for this lift. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then I wound up having to, to stay. Then it was like, I don't even know if I can bench press. And now I'm not going to get credit for the meat. And I won't get credit for the lift. lift yeah. So oh. I wind up benching the bar in the collar. So 55 pounds. Yeah, 143. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, no, that's 55. So it was oh, 20 kilo, 25 kilograms. Right. That's okay. all I could bench. And literally, it was this tricep. And, you know, you can't uneven it. I'm literally yeah. benching like this to lock oh. out the bar. And then by the time we got to deadlifts, I was DS- DMSO'd up <laughs> oh. by the time I started pulling. But oh. I got through it and I got my credit, so it is what it is. But you just learn from people. And, mm-hmm. and, and you know, Nick, I mean, you got some uh, partners that come into you, but you pretty yeah. much train solo. It's hard. Yeah. It's yeah, hard it's, to get that motivated to get in there and set that routine up of okay, man, I got to go and nobody's here today. Yeah, and that was why. Like for Brian, this was the first time he had some, a couple of guys training with him consistently, and what really I knew we were really in a good spot because on his last training deadlift for the, um, for the NAC deadlift, we we were smart. We set it up as close we could to. Uh, a non-traditional deadlift where a lot of guys were trained. And again, the younger guys, it doesn't matter. They were mm. trained in traditional uh, plates. We had a little rig, we rigged it up and it worked out well. And, and what I really liked about that day was he hit the number we needed, little arousal, and he had no partners that day. So I knew mentally we, he was in a really focused spot, spot because that's one thing that I think people need to really work on and concentrate on is the arousalness of training. Uh, there are Damn. some guys who just get so hyped up, and it's like after a while, man, that's going to shut you down. Like you don't if you're a, if you're a nine hundred pound deadlifter, you don't need smelling salts at three fifteen. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, you know, I, I just that's something I just look. Uh, you need to be able to do it with music, without music, and this is the, where the La La Zedo thing comes in. By the way. Um, you, you just need to be able to turn it on and turn it off. Yep. Cause, and you have to practice that you have to practice cause I'll get quiet and I don't want anybody talking to me. Mm-hmm. It's just, I'm, I'm rapping, I'm doing my thing. It's time to go turn around. All I am is focus on what I'm doing. I load the spring and just load the spring and then explode <laughs> out. And then once there, put the brakes on and set it back down in the rack and then yeah. If I'm gonna celebrate oh, no, I remember uh it was Jesse. Well, the one guy too was it was it Dave Hoff when he jacked up Louie mm-hmm. in that deal. But even like Jesse one time, somebody slapped him and he wasn't one of those guys who wanted to get slapped in the back. He went around and just jacked this fool. I think about <laughs> it. Like, but that's how me, like people yeah. go now that I was at, I was visiting a high school and they were I don't know what rapper was on. And they go, coach, you listen to this music when you train? I said, I used to. I said, I'm at a point in my life where my music of choice is sports radio. <laughs> so I listen to sports radio when I trade. I, I was listening to Barton Hahn uh, one day, and I, I posted um, – I, I think I did a max effort, like wagon wheel deadlift for me, and I posted something about – on a, uh, just hit a max, music of choice, Barton Hahn. I don't think I wonder if they'll re, I wonder if they'll retweet this. And Bart, <laughs> and Bart Hahn actually retweeted it yeah. and they contacted me 
and sent me a jersey and shorts from the Barton Han show. I got, oh, that's I cool. got that's a cool. basketball jersey hanging in my gym. <laughs> nice. So everybody's like, well, I was like, hey, man, I cannot not listen to Barton Han, man. They that's it. Me up. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I actually think a lot of things are the, com- the camaraderie of strength sports is very unique. It's more yes. so than football because mm-hmm. it ties all the genres together. Like, you meet different people from powerlifting, strongman, weightlifting, bodybuilding, and now even CrossFit. It just mm-hmm. seems like it's a everybody just knows, like they understand what you what you're going through. Mm-hmm. It might be a different modality. So it, it's been a like I said, from a fan's perspective of really just growing to love all the different genres of being strong in different manners. To, to actually get to be behind the scenes and and live it. Like I said, I, I I just can't be more thankful to Brian for giving me that opportunity because it's something that at this point in my career, it's a cool yeah, – well, like yeah. I don't know if I would have considered it a bucket list item, but it's definitely something that's yeah. up there. Like coaching in the world's strongest man is like going to the Super Bowl. That's mm-hmm. what people mm-hmm. need to understand. In that that's world – that's what yeah. it is. Coaching it, being on the sidelines of World's Strongest Man mm-hmm. is like being on the sidelines for a Super Bowl. And I'm uh, very, very honored to say I've been able to do both. That's it. And as you know, realizing that we've almost did two hours without even trying, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, oh, man. Like, we really kicked this in and we covered an awful lot. It, uh, Coach Ken, it was definitely an honor. Having well, I appreciate here. you all having me. Like oh, I said, man, I got the utmost respect for Nick and what he does. And oh, thanks. I, mean, I just love it, man. I just uh, he he motivates without motivating, and that's the best uh, part the about the truth. Me. I mean, that's if you want to look at it from a from that aspect, like it's just cool. Like I said, and then you know, meeting Mark Felix and and and, and just watching these guys do it at such a high level, and the fact like you know, Nick's continuing to press the limits of what goals he has set for him mm. in the powerlifting realm, man. It's just, you know, and again, and the exposure that I've gotten to have the facts that I get to now know these guys and consider mm. them friends and, and things like that. That's the, that that's what strength, that's what sports is all about is building relationships and fostering those relationships. And hopefully one day you, you can pay some, you can pay it forward. Like somewhere, yeah. somehow, how do you continue to pay it forward to the people who are, interested in what you are and like-minded subjects so you know the, the honor has been mine for you guys having me i mean i think it's cool what you guys are doing uh i was talking to somebody the other uh you actually yesterday we were talking and they're like man house you got to do a podcast i said you're right everybody's telling me that i've been on over a hundred podcasts <laughs> as a guest and yeah I'm like, man, I'm giving out all this. And, and as you guys can tell, I don't need to bring on a guest. I could just do the podcast <laughs> yeah. by myself and say, hey, what do you want to hear me talk about today and blow, be blow-minded for 45 minutes to an hour? So down the road, my wife's been begging me, so maybe – You got to do it. Maybe yeah. that'll be – yeah. And if, if you need a little help, uh, you ha- you know, let me know. I can, yeah, I can definitely it. assist you in, in getting yeah, Ben's, started. Ben's pretty good at that. Yeah, I'm yeah, pr- pretty good at it. Well, yeah, man, you're the angry dad, which is a great tagline. Thank you. <laughs> That's, yeah, everybody gets a little angry sometimes. Just a little bit. Just a little well, again, man, if there's anything I can ever do for y'all, and then anybody who's listening, oh, just uh, reach out. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. the crazy thing is, is I still had about four or five things I wanted to talk to you about we didn't get to. Oh, yeah, because we're going to definitely have to get you on here again soon. <laughs> hey, except for like a bathroom break, I don't have to really go. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on I've been on the road for three days and today is usually a recovery and get my debrief mm-hmm. notes. Like mm-hmm. I said, I'll type my report up for a corporate and then uh, restructure my week for the rest of the week. But again, thanks guys. I love to come back. And like I said, if there's anything I can ever do for any of you, just reach out and yes, I'll, I'll put do his, my best. I'll put his link tree yeah. in the notes so you guys, if you, you want to get a yeah. hold of Coach Ken, you can you can easily get a hold. And of I will him. say this: if you're in the Raleigh, I'm going to give a self, selfish plug. If you're Absolutely. in the Raleigh Durham area, or if you're anywhere in that North Carolina area, July 28th and 29th, myself and Steve Olson are hosting our first seminar. And we've got a terrific lineup with Mike Young, Nick Tuminello, Adam, uh, Adam Barber, Travis Mass, Steve. Uh, who else am I missing? Somebody big. Oh, Mike Buley. And then I'm going to go the last three hours. So, um, wow. 
Nice. It'll be a good two-day event. It's a Friday afternoon. It's at an all-day Saturday. It's at Steve's, one of Steve's gyms. We're going to have two open gyms. We've got a food sponsor. We've got a supplement sponsor lined up. So it'll be a really good day. And we're going to talk business and training. So thanks for letting me sneak that in. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank, man. No, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad I got up. to see you guys. And Same you guys here. got to come to my side of the country. Hey, I can't yeah. wait till you come out here because no, I know because you know, know it's going to be hot and right? sweaty. The question is, am I going to be in a sling or am I still going to be free, free flowing around? If if I'm free flowing, I can definitely train in your gym. If I'm yeah. not, you said you're going to get me in the pool. Yeah, yeah we'll, get, we'll get you in the pool, and then we'll, there's also things you can do. This pool is cold. This well, I I know what I can do. I can sit at a poker table because I I'm good at that. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have lots of that around here. I know the casino like. Two miles from the house, so we can That's head it. over there. All right, well, guys, enjoy the rest of the day and have a great weekend, and thanks again. No, oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We'll All right, Nick, uh, hit him with those famous words as we sign out. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for watching today. Thank you, Joe. I, I can't appreciate this enough house. I mean, it's just been an amazing show. And, and Ben, thank you. And for everybody, train hard, train smart, and be the absolute best you can be. And thank you.